good day to you all. Uh, I'm Malika, first year registrar of gynecology and obstetrics in Sri Javadanpur General Hospital. So today we are going to start uh, talk about partogram. So partogram, this is the national partogram we are using currently all island. So there are some few components in the partogram where we use to monitor the fetal well-being and the maternal well-being as well. So we'll, we will go through each and every component of the partogram. Uh, in within the next few slides beforehand we should know some few facts a uh, few core knowledge uh, before starting to know about the partogram so when should the partogram to be started if frequency of uterine contraction is more than two per 10 minutes we have to start a partogram or at an induction of labor irrespective of the uh, number of contraction and the dilatation of the cervix and uh, some core knowledge of the onset of labor. Onset of labor is at all when there's gradual cervical changes with dilatation and painful contractions. When there are all these three things, we consider the onset uh, labor has been started. And of course, the stages of labor. Uh, we all know there are three stages of labor, stage one, stage two, and stage three. Stage one, uh, again divided into two phases as latent phase and active phase. Stage two divided again into, a, into two phases as uh, passive phase and active phase. And stage three, uh, at the end, we can manage stage three either in two ways, which we, will going to, we are going to discuss in the next slide. So first stage, uh, so first stage start with the latent phase. It is from the onset of labor with painful contractions and gradual changes of the cervix up to four centimeter dilatation. Earlier it was considered as three centimeter, but with the latest guidelines, we are now considering up to four centimeter dilatation. So these cervical changes, it can be the effacement, position, usually the cervix is before the onset of labor, it is positioned at the posterior, posterior at the posterior phonics of the vagina, but with the onset of labor and progression, it will come to a more mid position. And uh, effacement also, effacement of the cervix will also gradually thin out and the cervix will be incorporated into the lower segment of the uterus at the full effacement. Then painful contractions. Uh, actually, the latent phase can be of variable duration. In multiparous women, it, women it can be lasting for days. But in a uh, in prime paras, I'm really sorry. Uh, in multiparous women, it can be lasting very short period. But in a prime gravida mothers, it might be lasting for days. Uh, but in uh, the next stage of the first stage of labor is established labor which is from the four centimeter dilatation up to the full dilatation. Here we get the regular painful contractions with increasing frequency and increasing strength of the contraction. So four centimeters to the full dilatation is the established labor or the active phase of the first stage of labor. Most of the time we are sending mothers to labor at this stage. Then the second stage starts, starts uh, with the full dilatation of the cervix until to the delivery of the baby. So with the full dilatation of the cervix, mother will not feel uh, the urge to push down until the bear down reflex comes into set, comes to set. So with the bear down reflex, with, uh, with the full dilatation, head has to descend up to the pelvic diaphragm. When the head is descending and stretching the pelvic diaphragm, which is basically the levitani and the coccygeus, you get the stretch re uh, receptors stimulated and mother will feel that urge to push, urge to push down. Uh, basically the same way as your rectum is fully loaded with feces and you feel the urge to defecate. The same mechanism acts here and mother will feel the urgence, uh, urge to push. So active stage of the second stage of labor start at this point. From that point up to the delivery of the baby is, called, is divided into is called as the active stage of the second stage of labor. This is where we are going to do much of the interventions. And then the third stage, it is the time from birth of the baby to the expulsion of the placenta and membranes. I told you that earlier as well, it can be managed either in two ways, either physiologically or actively. But what is recommended now is to manage the third stage as active management of third stage of labor because it is uh, it will reduce the postpartum hemorrhage and blood transfusion in the later time after the delivery. Uh, so the difference is there's not much of a big difference, but active management, what we do is 
uh, with the delivery of the anterior shoulder of the baby, we give a uterotonic most of the time oxytocin, and then uh, we do the uh, delayed cord clamping and control cord traction for the delivery of placenta. The change with the physiological management is we do not give any uterotonic at, at the delivery of the baby, and we do not do any delayed cord clamping, and we do not do uh, control cord traction. We just let the uh, maternal, we just use the maternal effort to use the uh, to deliver the placenta. So, however, when you are managing the third stage physiologically, it is taking much longer time, usually one hour. Active management will only take about half an hour. So, so little bit about the uh, time durations and delays of labor, which is very important because the doctor who is at the labor room has to identify these uh, delays and inform senior of your uh, medical officers to get any related intervention. So expected durations of labor. In a nadiparous woman, first stage of established labor, that is from four centimeter dilatation up to fully dilatation, we expect the duration to be around eight to 18 hours. For a multiparous woman, we expect that uh, the duration to be around five to 12 hours. This is not hard and fast uh, duration, but we usually expect a multiparous woman to finish the first stage of labor, first stage established labor around five to 12 hours. In second stage active phase, that is urging a uh, maternal urge to push to the delivery of the baby. We expect an oliparous woman to deliver the baby around three hours and a multiparous woman around two hours. Third stage, of course, it is same for both Naliparous and multiparous women, uh, active management is last. If you are using active management, third stage uh, should be completed within 30 minutes. If it is physiological management, it should be completed within one hour. So when to identify a delay in progress? Uh, in the first stage, establish labor from four centimeters to full, fully dilatation. A naliparous woman or a multiparous woman, if the dilatation uh, is less than two centimeters for four hours. We take four hours here because we do vaginal examination every four hours. That is the recommended time interval for a vaginal examination provided there are no any other uh, risk factors. Uh, then if there are uh, if the in the established first stage of labor less than two centimeters for for four hours is considered as a delay. In second stage active phase of the second stage of labor if an aliparous woman does not deliver by two hours or a multiparous woman does not deliver the baby by one hour uh, we consider it as a delay in uh, progress of the second stage of labor so here we have to do intervention either we we have to decide uh, we have to do the vaginal examination and check the mother see whether there's any there, there's any other obstruction or uh, inadequate maternal effort where we can offer her some support by the assisted vaginal delivery. If it is obstructed labor, of course, we have to go for an emergency cesarean delivery. So this, uh, for, for us to identify these things, you have to know about these time durations of a delay. Third stage, third, third stage as I told you, active management, uh, if it is taking more than 30 minutes after active management of third stage, we, take, uh, we uh, diagnose it as a prolonged third stage. If it is with physiological management, if it is taking more than one hour, again, a prolonged first stage, prolonged third stage of labor is diagnosed. Then, now with this core knowledge, we can now enter to the partogram uh, monitoring. So, partogram, it is a graphical representation of the progress of labor. It monitors the well-being of the both well-being of both mother and the baby. Can do timely interventions by early identification of abnormalities if you know how to interpret a partogram and how to monitor a partogram. So we will now go into each and every component of partogram one by one and see how we are going to monitor it and how we are going to interpret it. So for, first of all, the partogram starts with basic information. There you can get uh, patient's name, age, VHT number, gravida, parity, Blood group, date and time, very important, and special problems like patient is having anemia or patient is having cardiac disease or this whether this is a PG induction, the such special instruction. If you have to, uh, if you have to be ready with the postpartum hemorrhage, if you are expecting a postpartum hemorrhage, like if it if it is an anemic patient, you can have prophylactic measures in such cases. So the basic information in the first first part of the partogram. 
So the secondly, we come into the time. Time of we actually we here we put the time where mother comes. If, it, if the mother comes to the labor room around six a.m., we put the six a.m. point in this small box, uh, and from there onwards we can continue writing the time. Here, one one large box is considered as one hour. One small box here, then half an hour. So one box, one hour. So first hour, second hour, third hour. Here six a.m., seven a.m. 8 a.m. Uh, likewise, we can go on. So next one is the fetal heart heart rate monitoring. So basically, this is done by the midwives or the nursing officers at the labor room. But of course, the whenever you are doing vaginal examination or the assessment of the mother, you have to uh, check on the fetal heart rate as well. So fetal heart rate here. Uh, in the first latent phase, first stage latent phase of the labor, we have to monitor the fetal heart rate every 30 minutes. First stage active phase or established labor, that is from 4 centimeters to fully dilatation, every 15 minutes the fetal heart rate has to be monitored. That means every, uh, this small square is half an hour, uh, quarter, half of this small, small square is uh, 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, fetal heart rate has to be monitored. Then second pass, second stage passive uh, phase. You can monitor. We have to monitor the fetal heart rate every 10 minutes. And second stage active phase. Every five minutes, the fetal heart rate has to be monitored. Uh, second stage, of course, we have a separate area in the partogram to monitor the fetal heart rate. We will come to that later with the presentation. Then the CTG. CTG, something you all have to know, all CTGs are categorized in the, into three types. A CTG can be normal, can be suspicious or abnormal. So how do we categorize these CTGs is another lesson which we will going to go, go through later. So CTG, if you are going to put a CTG, you have to uh, always uh, go through the CTG in all aspects and put a uh, categorization, categorize the CTG and put the category here in the CTG color. Then the contractions. Here we have to identify very clearly what they monitor here is contraction free interval and duration of contraction. It is contraction free interval. You can see this is the duration of the contraction which can be categorized either less than 20 seconds by this dotted box or 20 to 40 seconds by this uh, line block box or by uh, it can or the contraction can be 40 to 60 seconds which we can uh, draw it uh, in a box by a check box so the duration is categorized by the boxing uh, the way we are going to draw the box uh, then the interval between two contraction we, uh, we can we can put it here so i can um, in within the uh, by the next slide you can understand how we are going to do it so for uh, here you can see there's one two three four five there are, it is basically one minute apart two minutes apart three minutes apart four minutes apart and five minutes apart every five minutes you are getting a contraction then we draw the uh, frequency of contraction here so we will go to that in the next slide so this contraction monitoring has to be done every 30 minutes. So here you can understand very clearly. So this patient who has come to labor room here at one point. So initially the labor at the labor, she was getting a mild contractions. That is less than 20 seconds. That is why we have dotted boxes here. So she was getting mild contraction less than 20 seconds every five minutes. So contraction free interval is five minutes. So that means for 10 minutes, she is getting two contractions. So which is mild contractions. Then with the progression of labor, maybe the patient is, uh, is being started with oxytocin. So the contraction frequency increases. Now here, uh, the contraction severity is also being increased. 20 to 40 minutes, uh, 40 seconds lasting contractions are coming every four minutes. Then with further progression here, Every three minutes, contraction free interval is three minutes. So every three minutes, she is getting a contraction which is lasting 20 to 40 seconds, which is a very good contraction. Then with further progression, this mother enters to this category where every two minutes, she is, she is getting contraction. That means for 10 minutes, she is, she is already getting five contractions. That is the maximum level we need a mother to have. Uh, that's the maximum level a mother should have 
in in respect to contractions so above five above five contractions per 10 minutes we consider it uterine hyperstimulation so here we have uh, blotted here but just for the just for your reference we have done it here but basically if the mother is contracting every one minute that means every so for the 10 minutes she has been getting contractions and this contraction is lasting 60 seconds so basically she is there's no contraction free interval uh, this kind of a contraction limit cannot be there so this is uterine have stimulation anyway we, we have to do some intervention actually this will not come before this uh, if you are monitoring the partogram properly if patient goes here that means you are not monitoring the partogram properly if you are monitoring here you have to stop so that is it with the contraction i hope you understood well about monitoring the contraction and how you are going to plot it so then we come to the oxytocin dose so this depends with uh, each unit basically what we do is we dissolve five units of uh, oxytocin in 500 ml of normal saline uh, and some units use uh, drops per minute and some units use milliliters per hour with uh, infusion pumps the best way is to use a infusion pump but sometimes when they are when you are out of infusion pumps you can use drops per minute so whatever the way what we need is to increase the oxytocin dose if the uterine contractions are inadequate in a gradual manner that means every 30 minutes you can increase the oxytocin dose not less than 30 minutes if the contractions are inadequate up to adequate contractions means four to five contractions per 10 minutes until you achieve that contraction limits with good ctg with good fetal heart rate you can continue increasing the oxytocin dose so next one the abdominal descent obviously we have to when you are doing a maternal assessment in the labor room you have to check the mother as a whole not just the vaginal examination before doing vaginal examination has to go through the mother with pulse rate blood pressure and then the abdominal examination to see whether the baby's head has come down uh, most of the time baby's uh, baby's head uh, when the head is engaged we consider the head has gone in three-fifth of the uh, three fifth of the head has gone in uh, below the pubic symphysis, and above the pubic symphysis, you can only feel two fifth. Here you can see head accommodates full width of the five fingers above the symphysis pubis. That head is not engaged. When the head is gradually engaging, going inside the pubic symphysis, head accommodates two fingers above the pubic symphysis. So that is the time head is engaged. So that um, when the head is engaged, that means the pelvic inlet, the uh, what we consider is the smallest diameter of the pelvis is the inlet so inlet if the head is engaged in the inlet invariably that baby has to come through the outlet provided that mother is having a gynecoid pelvis uh, that is the anatomy of labor again another lesson we will discuss it later some other time here what you have to understand is abdominal descent is very is also very important sometimes vaginally the mothers are fully dilated yeah, and, but the head is so high. If, if you don't touch the abdomen, you won't feel that this head is so high that this mother, this baby cannot be delivered vaginal. That assessment has to be come, uh, has to come not only by the vaginal examination, but by the abdominal examination as well. So abdominal descent is important. So you have to plot it. The plotting way I will discuss with the next slide. The next one, just adjacent to the abdominal descent, is cervical dilatation. Cervical dilatation, again, uh, something you have to master when you are at the labor room. So, vaginal examination, you have to check for the dilatation of the cervix. So, dilatation of the cervix, in a rough guide, this is the rough guide you can use, but however, each and every person's fingers are different in size. So you have to know the exact measurements of your own fingers. Basically, if the fingertip is accommodating the service, it is around one centimeter. One finger is accommodating, it's around 1.5 centimeters. If it is around two fingers, it's about three centimeters. If, if you can accommodate around three fingers, it is about five to six centimeter dilatation. If uh, four fingers are being accommodated, most of the time it is around seven to eight. However, you have to have your own measurements when you are doing these vaginal ex examinations. That, of course, comes with practice. You have to do more and more vaginal examination to precise your uh, measurements. So cervical dilatation, you can mark as a check, as a cross or a dot. 
here uh, and then uh, you can hear uh, clearly understand cervical dilatation here is four centimeters which is been uh, marked as a dot if you are using a dot for the cervical dilatation uh, you can use the abdominal descent measurement as a cross then otherwise you will miss uh, you can uh, the two measurements can exchange if you use the same uh, same dot for the both abdominal descent and cervical dilatation then uh, we come for the vaginal descent in the vagina so basically the station station is the uh, the presentation the vertex presentation in a vertex presentation the vertex relationship in to the ischial spine so if the ischial spine if the vertex is at the ischial spine we consider the station of the baby's head to be zero anything above it is minus anything below it is plus so station is also very important for us to understand the baby has descended the head has to come down through the pelvis for it to come out through the outlet so descent uh, station is also important which we can understand with the uh, uh, with the further when we are going further with the presentation uh, you can understand uh, practically in some case scenarios so next few uh, boxes you have to monitor is the LICO. So LICO again, uh, with one one uh, letter you can write. If the LICO is in, if you are having intact membranes, if the membranes are not ruptured yet, it is I. If the LICO is clear, it's C, meconium, M, blood stain B. And if the LICO is absent, you can write AB. Position, again, very important. Uh, but very difficult to appreciate for uh, new interns. But uh, the position, of course, we have to. Uh, most of the most of the time, uh, baby's head is positioned in the left occipital anterior position, which which is the preferred position. But the most preferred position is the occipital anterior position. Uh, for us to appreciate the position of the baby's head, you should know few landmarks of the fetal head. That is the anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle. So when you are, uh, you can clearly see here the anterior fontanelle is about is like a uh, diamond shape. Posterior fontanelle is triangular shape. So when you are doing vaginal examination, you have to palpate for the sagittal suture, which is the line joining these two uh, fontanelles. Uh, so when you do when you do the vaginal examination, feel the sagittal suture, and when you are going through the uh, sagittal suture you will fall into a dip and that dip you can feel for the diamond shape or if it is a triangular shape then it is posterior fontanelle however it is uh, easier said than being done uh, when the mother is in the labor with uh, contractions pains and uncooperative patients it's very difficult to appreciate the uh, position of the head also with the uh, degree of molding and caput which is most of the time will be there uh, in the normal labor so the tip is when you are doing the uh, vaginal examination go through the sagittal suture and when you fall into a dip and then further move your finger for forward if your finger moves forward further that means it is anterior fontanelle because with the uh, molding these fontanelles comes close together so there won't be much of the space for you to appreciate the shape of the fontanelle so uh, if the sagittal suture continues further following the dip it is most of the time uh, anterior fontanelle. If it is posterior fontanelle, you will go with the sagittal suture. You fall into a dip, but uh, that if when you move forward further with the finger, you will feel that this line is separating in two ways. So most of the time, that is posterior fontanelle. However, if it is, it is really good if you can appreciate the position of the head. Uh, however, it is it is also coming with more and more practice. Then the caput. Caput is a boggy, dematous swelling of the fetal scalp. It disappears without treatment. It is no, uh, there's no significant pathological significance in it. Uh, we see most of the time caput is there with most of the babies. What is important is molding. If you have molding, uh, mind you, the molding has to be there for the baby to come through that bony pelvis. But molding, excessive molding is harmful, harmful for the baby. So molding, when the usually there is uh, when 
suture lines in the baby's head are separated. Their suture lines are felt easily. Bones are separated. When the bones just touching each other, then we when then we say it is first degree molding, uh, grade one molding. So when the bones are overlapping, but when you do the vaginal examination, you can push that two bones back into the normal position. Then that is grade two molding. So when you do the vaginal examination and you feel that the bones are overlapping, when you try to push that two bones back into the same position, but they are not going back, then that is grade three molding. That is where you have to stop. Grade three molding is something uh, something we have to do some intervention that this uh, have to understand that this baby cannot come through the vagina because already the bones have gone on each other and it is not going back to normal stage means whatever it is going to crush is going to be the brain thereafter the brain of the baby so grade 3 molding is a con uh, is is uh, is a indication for for you to abandon labor and go ahead with a cesarean delivery up to up to grade 2 molding of course we can appreciate and uh, provided that this uh, grade of the molding is not progressive and the dilatation is more towards full dilatation we can allow the labor to progress then the next few boxes of the partogram are for the maternal well-being monitoring that is blood pressure pulse rate and temperature monitoring uh, partogram itself says the pulse has to be monitored every 30 minutes and blood pressure temperature every four hourly but this frequency has to be increased according to the situation if the mother is having PIH or preeclampsia uh, and you are allowing the mother to go into labor then of course you have to increase the uh, frequency and if you are suspecting chorioamnionitis again you have to increase the frequency of temperature monitoring and pulse rate monitoring so that depends on the clinical scenario of the patient and next the action line whatever following now once you go through all these uh, boxes we have discussed already at the end you have to give an action to the patient if you are going to do a ve next four hours you can put that action you can write it as allow progress we will review in again four hours time review four hours kind of an action has to be post, uh, written where at the end of assessment of each uh, at the end of the assessment of each time so a little bit above the alert line and the action line so here this this alert line is being started at three centimeters here you can see the abdominal descent is also being plotted as the as a dot vaginal examination is also plotted as a dot bit confusing here so if you can uh, make a cross here it will be easier for the graphical representation so cervical dilatation either from three or four centimeters you can start the alert line that we expect alert line is something we expect this mother to progress in her labor as one centimeter per hour that does not happen always that not most of the time mothers are going deviating from this line however this is what we are expecting one centimeter per hour so action line we draw four centimeters away that is four hours away from the alert line according to who a recommendation and if if your pro labor progression is going or crossing the action line we have to make some intervention uh, and you have to check whether check the reason for the crossing and do intervention to expedite the delivery so this is the whole partogram as a whole now we have gone through all the uh, all the components of the feet uh, partogram starts from the beginning now this is a this is mrs y 32 year old mother in her second pregnancy with previous one miscarriage p naught plus one and her blood group is o positive and your date and time bht and she has come to labor room at 6 a.m you can see here the time has been plotted 6 a.m then after every hour they have plotted the time so at 6 a.m her fetal heart rate has been monitored continuously you can see nice to the process being made uh, baseline heart rate is around 140 fetal heart rate is being monitored so and ctg they have uh, put a ctg and that is normal then the contraction monitoring so at the 
beginning contractions were mild contractions that, that means less than 20 second contractions which is coming every five minutes however thereafter they might have started oxytocin yeah here 15 drops per minute oxytocin being started and you can nicely see the contraction frequency has increased uh, every three minutes she was getting contractions that is about 20 to 40 seconds lasting and then after the strength of the contraction has increased because these uh, these boxes are checked so that these contractions are lasting 40 to 60 seconds and every three minutes she is getting contraction which is fairly good and then we come for the cervical dilatation and descent patient was uh, sent to labor room at three centimeter dilatation at that time abdominal descent is two-fifth palpable abdominal so uh, and we will finish up the monitoring at the at the admission to labor room so at the on the admission to labor room cervical descent or the station of the patient baby's head was around zero that is at the ischial spine like it was clear baby is in left occipital anterior position and there was no caput no molding zero zero and mother's pulse blood pressure and temperature being monitored so after four hours they have reviewed the patient uh, so four hours cervical dilatation is seven centimeters which is fairly good that means she is uh, progressing nicely one centimeter per hour is being kept which is unlikely but this is for the graphical presentation we have put it but she is nicely progressing in her labor and there's an abdominal descent nicely earlier it was two fifth palpable abdominal now one fifth palpable and then uh, station of the baby earlier it was zero now it is plus one obviously now the abdominal it has gone down so vaginally it has to come down as well Slyco is still clear still in the left occipital anterior position and uh, there's no caputo molding so the action would be allow progress so this is the normal way we normal labor this is the way we are monitoring and plotting the partogram so little bit about the second stage monitoring this is the second stage monitoring part. It is the lowermost part of the partogram. Here we monitor the fetal heart rate mainly and commencing the commencement of the pushing stage. That is the act, uh, active uh, second stage of the active active st stage of the second stage of labor has to be uh, marked here. Then uh, fully dilatation time has to be marked here as well and then every 10 minutes in the passive phase of the second stage of labor every 10 minutes we are uh, monitoring the fetal heart rate once this uh, maternal pushing effort starts we start to monitor the fetal heart rate every five minutes so uh, few case scenarios for you to understand the importance of the partogram here in the first case scenario again uh, mrs uh, mrs y in a 32 year mother in her second pregnancy with previous one miscarriage or positive mother has come to labor room at 6 a.m everything looks normal and they have started oxytocin and with that the gradual increasement of the contractions was seen and she has come to labor room around three centimeter dilatation and then uh, with the contractions her labor has progressed initially uh, station was at zero like it was clear and left occipital anterior position with no caputo molding but after four hours uh, her dilatation was around five centimeters abdominally she has descended uh, one fifth palpable and vaginally also the station has come to plus one position uh, then here also everything looks normal you can go ahead and allow progress this labor however after four hours from the last this vaginal assessment uh, her vaginal examination has crossed the action line which is still around six centimeters and she has an abdominal palpation there's no descent vaginal uh, examination there's no station coming down there's no vaginal descent as well still the lyco is clear no caputo molding but uh, this looks like action line has been uh, has been crossed and we have to do some intervention and this looks like uh, primary dysfunctional labor most so the appropriate management at this point would be an emergency cesarean delivery because this baby is not coming down because because uh, primary dysfunctional labor can be due to many reasons most of the time capillophilic disproportion and then this patient 
again the same way case, same case scenario uh, started oxytocin has come to the labrum around 3 cm uh, abdominal descent is there with the first vaginal examination but with the first vaginal examination your position has come to left occipital transverse position which is not a problem actually because still the labor is progressing with the descent of the baby's head this head can turn. So there's a little bit of caput, grade one molding is there. Still, we can allow progress this labor, uh, thinking that, that this head will turn. But with the next assessment, you can do uh, without waiting for four hours. You can do much earlier. Here, we have to do it because the fetal heart rate seems to be dropping on and off uh, with the progression of labor. So with the next assessment vaginal examination still remains in the same position and descent there's no abdominal descent or vaginal descent still the position of the head is left occipital transverse and there's developing grade 3 molding which is the time we have to stop uh, abandon the labor and go ahead with the emergency cesarean delivery because this is deep transverse arrest so uh, I hope you can understand much of much about this uh, partogram monitoring here. You can understand at a glance if you know how to interpret it, you know what to do. You, you can understand where the patient is, what the baby is having, uh, going through by just looking at the partogram properly. So these two case scenarios would give you some insight about the partogram. So before the end point i would like to remind you a little bit about postpartum monitoring monitoring of the labor ward mothers as well following delivery uh, we continue to monitor mothers at least for two hours uh, with the mios monitoring chart mios is modified early obstetric warning chart uh, there we monitor everything actually uh, most of if you monitor this properly you won't miss anything all these pph uh, and all the other complications following delivery can be caught if you monitor the first uh, meos monitoring chart properly so that has to be this includes the rest, restless drowsiness alertness and orientation respiratory rate pulse rate systolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure urine output fundus level bleeding pv everything so this is actually a color coded diagram uh, color coded color coded form where if uh, either one of these parameters goes into the orange range or the red range uh, you have to inform your seniors and get an opinion for any further interventions if any of these parameters uh, are if two of these parameters are in yellow range again you have to inform your seniors if all the parameters are in uh, green range then of course you are happy you can continue the observation and after two hours you can send the mother into the normal ward from labor ward so that's it about our labor ward partogram management i hope you understood something about the part of the monitoring. Thank you.